Well, good morning, everybody. Who's excited to be at church today? Wow, I'll tell you what. That's uh, quite a way to start a service. And let me just tell you, if this is your first time here, we do this every single weekend. So this is nothing new for our church. It might be something new for you. And, and we're just super excited that you have joined us. Uh, we're excited that if this is your first time joining us online or if you're watching from online, that you have carved out time to be a part of this. And uh, it is a good day, so happy Easter. And of course, I'll begin with celebrating along with you by saying he has risen. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And uh, I'm just so glad that we're able to share in this uh, time together. Thursday, we had a packed house just like this on Thursday. So you all are our second service, and we got one right after you. And let me just tell you in advance that God moved in a mighty way on Thursday. And uh, many, many people came to the Lord and right on the spot at the, the middle of this service, because we're only like halfway through, in the middle of this service, you know, 13 people gave their lives to Christ and they were baptized right behind those doors. Yeah. And so let me just tell you, you might be here for a very specific reason today. You might have thought it was random, but it, it just might be that God has brought you to this place or brought you to watching online so that you can make the most important decision of your life, which is to surrender your life to a risen Savior. So let's uh, get started as I jump into God's word today. Uh, I want to give you some, some uh, themes to work through as we walk through some important ideas today. At 2.15 a.m. on December 16th, 1811, residents of the town of New Madrid, Missouri, which is about two hours south of us in the boot hill of Missouri, they were jolted from their beds by an earthquake. The ground heaved and pitched and it hurled furniture and snapped trees, destroying barns and homesteads all across the region. The shock waves traveled as far as Cincinnati, Ohio, toppling chimneys, and as far as Charleston, South Carolina, where the shock waves literally rang church bells. Now, sections of the riverbed below the Mississippi rose so high that parts of the river actually ran backwards. Thousands of fissures ripped open fields and geysers burst from the earth and it spewed sand and water and mud and coal high into the air. Now there were actually three earthquakes that took place in a short period of time in about a two and a half month time period between December of 1811 and February of 1812. Each of those earthquakes of the three had a minimum magnitude of 7.5 the highest one being 7.9, making them the three most powerful earthquakes ever to this day in the continental United States. And it shook an area 10 times larger than that affected by the, what's known as the famous Great Earthquake of 1906 in San Francisco, which was a 7.8. You may not have realized that. Everyone kind of thinks of, of California, but it's right here, right underneath us. In 2010, FEMA came out with a study that showed that if those earthquakes hit today, now that it's more populated than it was in 1811, they would leave more than 7 million people homeless and the death toll would be countless. Happy Easter, right? Right? You're thinking, wow, I mean, that's kind of devastating. Well, it is shocking just to realize that. But I find it fascinating how earthquakes work because basically there's a significant movement under the earth, right? Or an upheaval of some sorts, a, a shift, a release of energy, and then shock waves move out from the epicenter of this event and continue to have impact. And it's that idea that inspired me for the theme of today's service. For today, we are talking about the shock wave, the shock waves. And today, I, I don't want to talk about the earthquakes that took place here in Missouri, you know, in 1811. I want to talk about a series of earthquakes that both literally and figuratively shook the earth 
and changed all of history. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to the first earthquake that we're gonna look at, which is found in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 54. This is the earthquake that is uh, associated with the death of Jesus on the cross. So as we pick up this text, Jesus has been suffering on the cross, and here's what it says. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Other, other uh, accounts of gospel accounts would say, this is where Jesus said, it is finished. He died right in this moment. Verse 51, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people there. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified, and they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Now, in this moment... It's very obvious, the event, uh, the energy, if you will, the significant moment was the fact that Jesus had just died. Jesus had died. And, and following that, there was a, a shock wave off the earthquake around the death of Jesus. Now, if you look through the text, there's a lot of different things that are said here. I want to focus on one major shockwave, but, but let me just mention the other things that, that it says. First, you know, there was a, a physical shockwave. It says the earth shook, the rocks split, and tombs broke open. Remember, tombs were carved out of rock. Tombs were inside caves, and they would roll rocks in front of it. And so tombs broke open. All of this is Physical evidence, just like the church bells ringing in Charlotte from the shock waves, well, these things rattled and rumbled and broke open as a result of the earthquake. It also mentions that holy people were raised to life. This is a supernatural effect. But, but I want you to put a pin in that because this shock wave isn't actually a direct result of Jesus' death but instead, it connects to his resurrection. And I'll explain why it's here uh, a little bit later. So kind of put a pin in that idea. But the main shockwave that is mentioned here will require a little bit of explanation. It says, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, if you didn't grow up in church or if you're new to faith, this might not mean anything to you. And even if you did grow up in church, you might not fully understand the significance of this event, that this shock wave had an impact that would continue to have impact. Well, in the first century, the temple in Jerusalem was the center of Jewish religious life. It was where animal sacrifices were carried out and Worship, according to the law of Moses, was followed faithfully by the people. In the temple, there was a great, huge, big veil that separated the holy of holies from the rest of the temple where everybody interacted and passed through. Now, the holy of holies, what was that all about? Well, that was the earthly dwelling place for the presence of God. Think about that. At that time in history, there was only one place on planet Earth where the presence of God actually dwelt. It was in the Holy of Holies. And there was this veil that separated that space from the space where everybody could walk around. You see, the veil had a significance to it that everybody in Jewish culture understood it signified that man was separated from God by sin, right? A holy God cannot have anything to do with sinful man. Now, only the priest, the high priest, was permitted to pass beyond the veil and only one time a year so that this priest could go in 
for the sake of all of Israel and make an atonement for their sins. Atonement is a big word. Let me explain it again in case you're new to faith. In other words, there would be a sacrifice made to pay the penalty or the price for the sins of the Jewish people. When you broke the rules, when you committed a crime, when there was any kind of sin, a just God required some kind of payment, some kind of you know, sacrifice to cover those mistakes. And so there was a sacrificial process with animals and the priest would go in only once a year into the Holy of Holies to satisfy uh, the wrath of God for the sin of the Jewish people. So with that background, you understand the significance of the curtain being torn in two was huge. It wasn't just some random curtain ripping. We've got curtains in this room. If they were to rip, it would just be, you know, something blew it over or, or the sewing didn't hold up. It, it, didn't have, it wouldn't have any major significance. But this veil being torn had huge significance. It meant that there was new access to the presence of God. It was new access now provided by Jesus's atoning death. This is why it's associated with his death. That's why right after he said it is finished, the the curtain and the veil ripped because Jesus was the once and for all perfect atoning sacrifice. That's why Jesus is referred to as a spotless lamb. The animal sacrifice didn't hold, right? Every year they had to do it. But but Jesus was the perfect lamb of God and his sacrifice would be once and for all. This is huge. It meant that the Old Testament sacrificial system and the temple rituals were now obsolete, done, not needed. It meant there was no more need for temple priests, for altars or sacrificed animals. All of that was done with and Jesus became the new temple or the new meeting place between God and man. If you wanted to be in the presence of God, uh, all you had to do was go through Jesus. All you had to do was have a relationship with Jesus. This was a game changer. Now, with that background, I want you to listen to what one of the, uh, the Hebrew writer, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, wrote to the early Christians, see if it makes a lot more sense to you now if you hear these words from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in other words, those of you who are following Christ, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is the body, Let us draw near to God is the end of that passage. Let us draw near to God. Here the Hebrews writer is speaking, again, this is after the resurrection. He's saying, look, we need to understand that that we can have confidence now to enter into the presence of God because the veil that separated man from God has been torn by the body of Jesus being sacrificed on the cross. So now by Jesus, we all have a way to access God. You can start to see the shock wave and the effects right there in the lives of the early Christian. They had access. And it also is, is how you know and why you can understand why everything about our faith here in 2021 is centered on Jesus because Jesus is the one who allows us access to God. Amen? So that's the first earthquake that I wanna share with you this morning. The second earthquake is recorded in just a few uh, verses later. It's the next chapter, Matthew chapter 28, verses one through five. This is when the angel rolled back the uh, you know, stone from the empty tomb. Listen what the passage says. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and, and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel, the Lord, had come down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. 
the guards were so afraid of him, the angel, that they shook and became like dead men. The angel then said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Now come and see the place where he lay. Go in there, look, and see that he's gone. He's not in there. Now, the first important observation I want you to to make about this is the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away to let people see in that he was not there. Now, a lot of people have never caught that subtlety. Maybe it's because you saw a movie or you went to a play or a a musical and there was this moment where the stone rolls back and then Jesus comes out like this smiling, right? You know, and that's kind of how some people associate it with, uh, but you need to understand the earthquake is tied to the announcement of Jesus's resurrection, not actually the resurrection itself that had already taken place we don't know when how or or what went on there that's one of those things that like we'll have to ask God when we get to heaven like what happened in that exact moment when he conquered sin and death I mean was there flames you know coming off of his body did he spin in the air like you know what happened tell us We, we would love to know but but that part we don't know this earthquake this earthquake revealed the good news that he had already been resurrected and it changed everything. Now that's something we say all the time. I'll say it like 10 times in this sermon. I mean, we've had series uh, that, that were titled how the you know, Easter changes everything. You may have even posted that on a, on a social media post at some point, but do you know why it changes everything? Do you know how the resurrection changes everything? Because you need to know. Some of you know it, but maybe not all the way. Some of you, this is again, all new news. So I'm glad that you asked, how does it change everything? Because I want to tell you. You see, there's too many ways for me to fit into one sermon, but I want to cover now four different shock waves that come from the resurrection, all right? Four shockwaves. The event happens, and then there's this rippling effect. The first one is this. The resurrection proves that Jesus is the Son of God. It proves it. Listen to what it says in John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18. Jesus says, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it back up again. What does it sound like he's describing? No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord, and I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it back up again. This is a command that I received from my Father. Now, this is Jesus talking. Jesus was constantly telling people about his relationship to not just God, But the father, it freaked people out when he referred to God as his father. People, we are a little bit more familiar with that verbiage, but man, in the first century, Jewish people were not familiar with that, you know, familiarity. He's your father. So Jesus was constantly referring to God as his father. And in this verse, Jesus is claiming to have power over death. So here you've got an example of what happened many times where Jesus is talking about his father giving him authority because he was the son of God. Now listen, if Jesus fails to resurrect, then he is exposed as a liar. There ain't no shockwave coming off of this event. It would be a big dud Right? If a guy walks around claiming that his father gave him the power to raise from the dead and then that man is killed and he stays dead, everything ends right there. But it didn't go down that way. He came back to life and because of that, it uniquely positions him to be fully trusted and to be fully worshiped as the one and only son of God. Amen? Like nobody else 
only him, and a course that has ongoing impact, just like a shockwave, has ongoing impact all the way to this day into our lives this morning. The second shockwave that came from the resurrection is that it verified the truth of scripture. It verified the truth of scripture. Now, can I explain this? The Old Testament had predicted time and time again of a coming Messiah, a coming Messiah in very specific terms. So you've got this Old Testament book that's written way in advance of the resurrection talking about you know, the Messiah coming in a certain way, doing certain things, acting a certain way, saying certain things, and all of that was fulfilled by Jesus. More than 300 plus prophecies perfectly fulfilled by Jesus, which would verify the truth of scripture. And if Jesus did not resurrect, it would then really create a big hole in the idea that you should believe the truth of scripture. Here's how Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. Paul writes, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is our faith. Everything kind of hinged on the resurrection. And so when Jesus does come back to life, the shockwave is it verified the truth of scripture because like Paul's saying, look, our, preach, our preaching would be useless and your faith would be useless. Guess what else would be useless? The, the word of God. If it wasn't true and Jesus doesn't resurrect, there'd be no reason to believe the validity of the Old Testament or the authority of the Old Testament as the word of God. And there would certainly be no even reason to write the New Testament, which was about Jesus. And so then, boom, you know, everything falls apart. But it didn't because Jesus resurrected. Amen? Amen. Number three, the resurrection guarantees the future resurrection of those in Christ. This one's huge. That means if you're a Christian today, this has direct impact. The, The shockwave hits you. It means that you have the power to resurrect. What's that all about? Well, in John chapter 11, Jesus said it this way. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. I'm not just going to resurrect, but like it's all about me within my power and I'm the one that's gonna do it. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Do you see how Jesus is making the connection? I have the power to lay down my life and pick it back up again. And when I do that, those that put their faith in me are gonna have the ability to experience the exact same thing, not by their own power, but by my power. This is, this is important. Listen, we see a preview of this reality earlier in the last earthquake. Remember when I told you to put a pin in uh, one little idea? Well, it was a big idea. It was this little comment that happened after the death of Jesus as Matthew is writing and he says, and there were holy people who came back to life. You might've been like, hey, why, don't skip that. I wanna hear a little bit about that. Well, let me just tell you that this was immediate evidence that what Jesus said was true, that, that it guarantees the future resurrection of those in Christ. So here's what happened, and here's why I kind of paused on it in the first earthquake. When you first read it, because of the translation, it doesn't read clearly, and it kind of says something that makes people believe that when the shockwaves came off of the death of Jesus, it rattled rocks, it split the earth, and it opened tombs, right? And then the next sentence says, and holy people were raised to life. So the natural thing to think is that right there in the moment at the death of Jesus, holy people came to life. But that's not actually what the text says. And even if you go back and read it, you'll kind of see that it corrects itself and says, and after the resurrection, they went into the holy city of Jerusalem. So what you need to understand is 
And the people that were raised to life were raised to life after the resurrection of Jesus. They didn't resurrect before Jesus resurrected. I mean, think about it. So they come to life at the death of Jesus and all the dead people that were in the ground are just hanging out, playing cards for three days, and then they go into Jerusalem? No, the tombs opened up, but the people did not get raised to life until the resurrection because it was evidence that what Jesus had been saying is true. Look, the saints, and we, we don't know any details about this, and it frustrates me, maybe like you. It's like, don't throw a line in there that says a bunch of holy people raised from the dead and then walked into the city and not tell me who it was. Was it like Moses? Was it, it's the saints, who was it? Did people know them? Were they people that, how would they know that it was Moses? If, you know, because, I mean, no one, they didn't have pictures back then. If Moses has been dead for a long time, how, who's walking around and does anyone even know that they're dead? And then what do they do? Do they float to heaven or do they have to like live again here on earth, which would really stink, right? You know, <laughs> so it's like, we don't know. All of that is a mystery. We'll have to wait until heaven. The reason it's mentioned is to give validity to the claims that Jesus had said, look, I am the resurrection and the life, and if you put your faith in me, you're gonna have the power to come back to life through my power, and you won't be dead when everyone else thinks you're dead. That will be just the beginning. And so that is, of course, the good news, and that was immediate evidence of a shockwave taking place. Number four, the resurrection empowers the Christian for everyday living. It empowers the Christian, those that have put our faith in Christ, to live on this earth because living on this earth is not easy when it's completely filled with sin all around us and in us. And we were never meant to try to live on this earth alone. We can't do it on our own. We need the resurrection power. Now listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter one, as again, he's talking to early Christians. It's just really interesting that you know all these disciples and all these followers of Jesus that are writing and talking to the earliest Christians, everything that they're saying is kind of connected back to this resurrection because that's what changed everything. And Paul says this, again, to the early Christians in Ephesus. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. I hope you see this. I hope you understand this in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you and to his immeasurable great power for us who believe in him. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. Now that's a shortened version of verse 18, 19, 20, and 21. That, that gives us a very clear message. The power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that will raise you from the dead in the future if you put your life in Christ is not just for that ending transition, but it's also available to you right now. You don't have to wait for this power when you die. It is available to help you live, amen? It's, a, it's available in the present, it's available now. These are the shock waves. It empowers us for Christian living. It guarantees our future resurrection and it verifies the truth of scripture. It proves that Jesus is the son of God. This is the shock wave that impacts all these different areas that then impacts our lives. And I can personally testify that these shock waves rumbled and rattled and traveled for over 2,000 years and eventually impacted my heart personally. And maybe your heart personally as well. Because now, I stand before you in, in the year 2021, and as a sinner, I know that I have been saved, and I know who to turn to for all my problems. His name is Jesus, amen? I know 
what I can trust as truth in a world where there is so much lies, so many people fabricating things, so much false information. I know there is one place that I can go to for truth and it's called the word of God, amen? Listen, I get to live with hope in a very hopeless place called the world, in a place that has disease and death and tragedies and disappointment and guilt and shame. I get to live on this earth with a hope that goes beyond now and it's called heaven, amen? And then finally, listen, I get to know that while I'm on this earth, I'm not alone. I have access to a power. I have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit that dwells in me. God is with me now. He's not just waiting up in heaven for me then. He's with me now. And that is the Holy Spirit and that is everything. Amen? Listen, it's all because of the resurrection. And it's only because of the resurrection. And there's something really important that you need to understand about all these shockwaves, all these benefits, all these life-changing scenarios that I've just shared with you. The resurrection of Jesus doesn't automatically solve everyone's problems. Now, now I want you to hear something very carefully. It means now that everyone has the opportunity to have access to God if And it's a big old if, if you go through Jesus. Like this isn't like it's for everybody and you get to like swing in here one one weekend of the year and go, oh, cool, these benefits sound great, I'll take it. No, 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 no. It also means you don't get to come here every week and never actually walk with the Lord, but you know, it's a social environment for you or a place that just makes you feel good. You don't get to just claim these benefits because you're in proximity to to someone who's talking about them. And you've got to go through the veil, through Jesus, and only through Jesus. So let me be clear about the stark reality that every human being faces Because of sin, everyone is separated from God and deserves eternal punishment, which is called hell, until they go through and to Jesus. That's the reality. You've got to go through what I'm calling today a third earthquake. We've talked about two already, but there's a third earthquake. And this one's more figurative, right? It's, it's my way of wrapping uh, this sermon up to a, a place that kind of connects to the theme. But it's, I think, a pretty legitimate way to describe it. If you've ever come to Christ, those of us that have, let me tell you, uh, there's a moment that you come to the realization that you need to surrender your life to a savior. And it ain't easy. It is hard. It is difficult because we are innately selfish and stubborn And to say it's like an earthquake, I don't think is an understatement. I mean, you know, when when the angel and anytime angels or God or anyone like connected to people and appeared to people, they shook. They physically shook, just like the guards did in our story today. And when you come face to face with Jesus as a sinner, you're going to shake. There will be an earthquake. Man, your whole life is gonna be turned upside down. You have to die to yourself. That doesn't sound easy, right? Death, you gotta die to yourself. You become a new creation, a new creature, new life. All of this, it is, it is a, uh, a, a jarring and rattling event in a good way, but it ain't easy because it takes a certain realization of just how dead you are in your current condition and admitting that, and then surrendering. And yes, it's jarring, but yes, it's good. But that's the only way you get these benefits. You have to go through Jesus. Some of you haven't gone through Jesus yet, meaning you haven't given your life to Jesus yet because you're just stubborn, right? You just have, you're not ready. And if you're not ready, you're not ready, right? You've gotta be ready for this. But some of you have not gone to Jesus yet because You believe that you have just sinned so much or sinned so bad that there's not possibly enough forgiveness for what you have done and you kind of are left in limbo. 
And can I just tell you that that is not the case, right? There is not something that you have done that is so bad or so great that God does not have the power to forgive you, to heal you, to redeem you, to renew you. Like he is not short on resurrection power, amen? amen. Some of you though don't know that and you really believe that, that maybe you've gone too far and there's no amount of grace left for you or there's no power left for you. Can I just tell you a story to wrap things up? In Ezekiel chapter 37, there's this account of, of God interacting with Ezekiel, a prophet of God. And in this conversation, it moves outside. So God's having a conversation with Ezekiel. Ezekiel. They go outside to an area called the Valley of Dry Bones. And in this place, there are bones of, of numerous people just strewn all over the place. It's, it's a place of death. And it's, a, it's called the Valley of Dry Bones, which is an indication of just how dead these people are, right? Like these aren't like people that are dying or people that have just died or people that are, you know, decaying and been dead for a couple of weeks. Like they've decomposed so much that all that's left is dry bones. And God has Ezekiel walk and look at all these dry bones and he asks Ezekiel this question, Ezekiel 37. He says, can these bones live? You see, God was looking to show what he is capable of to Ezekiel. Can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel's response is, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you're, you're sovereign, God. You, you tell me. Like, I don't want to play this game. Just tell me what you, you know, tell me. And God says, I want you to say, Ezekiel, I want you to say to the bones. It'll be my words, but you're going to say it. I want you to say, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Again, God is setting up this opportunity for Ezekiel to see what God is capable of. And then this is what God says for Ezekiel to say. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am Lord. So Ezekiel's like, oh, okay, he, he, I mean, this is, this is getting big, right? This is a moment. Ezekiel knows he's having a moment. And he knows it because all of a sudden it says in Scripture, there was a noise. There was a noise that he heard. Scripture says a rattling sound. And the bones began to come together. Can you imagine all these bones beginning to like uh, levitate and, and click and clack together? It says bone came to bone. And I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and then the skin covered them. And then God said, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain bodies that they may live. And they came to life right before Ezekiel and stood up on their feet and it is described as a vast army right in front of his eyes of people alive that were long gone dead. Listen, there's a song playing behind me and the title of the song is called Rattle. They already sang it once for you. You did a great job singing with them. But listen, they're playing behind me because this song is written from this passage. And this passage is a picture of the power of God, the capability of God. Right, so when you are sitting here today and realize you are a sinner and that you've made mistakes and maybe the Holy Spirit has opened you up to the idea that maybe now, like never before, you're ready to admit that you need a savior, that you can go to Jesus and know that the resurrection that he went through can take place in your life. Like there's not something that you've done that disqualifies you from being able to receive this power and God will come into your life and he's not surprised by anything that you've done or anything that you've messed up. He has the power to forgive all of that and make you into a new creation right now. Now listen, 
There are multiple people who came forward on Thursday. I think 13 people got up right from the seats where you're sitting in and said, I want to give my life to Christ right now and be baptized and be obedient to God's word right now. Now the doors below the screen here are going to open up and we've got a giant pool in there ready to go. And we've got a change of clothes for every single person. And they're opening the doors right over here. And there's about five or six people that are in the hallway ready to high five you and celebrate with you. Now, I'm asking, is there anybody in this room or maybe online and you need to get in your car and make your way here right now? I don't care if you're in your pajamas, right? But I believe in this room, there are people that are ready to finally say yes to Jesus, to go through Jesus. So don't worry about, did you bring clothes or do you, you know, I wasn't prepared for this. If God is calling you, you need to respond. And so we're gonna worship and you're gonna see some who are getting baptized. And if it's time for you, I'm gonna be standing right here and I'll be the first person to greet you and help you every step of the way. And we will pray with you and you can jump in that water and you can seal the deal because listen, it's not the water that saves you. It's that you're willing to admit you're a sinner. You give your life to Jesus and by his blood and grace alone, you are saved. And then you mark it with baptism, right? So let's stand together and let's worship. And if you're ready to make a decision, I'll meet you right down here.